Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I am O'Brien McMahon, and this is People Business. In this episode, I'm joined by Julie Dirksen. Julie is the author of the books Design for How Humans Learn and Talk to the Elephant, Design Learning for Behavioral Change. She is a learning strategy consultant with a focus on incorporating behavioral science into learning interventions. She's been an adjunct faculty member at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design and is a Learning Guild Guide Master. In this conversation, we go deep into her book, Talk to the Elephant, and she talks about the elephant and rider metaphor and how we can apply that to building learning experiences for our employees in a corporate setting. We talk much broader than that. We talk about learning in general. We talk a little bit about childhood learning, about adult learning, about corporate learning, about learning that we do on our own. But really, the whole point of this is just to understand the different ways that we can be building or thinking about learning environments at work. And we talk about a wide range of things, including when learning or creating some kind of training or learning is not the answer and how to identify what other things might be getting in the way of seeing the behaviors that you want to see that don't necessarily get solved by training. So really interesting conversation. If you like learning, if you like training, if you're trying to level up your workforce, there's a ton in here to think about. If you want to connect with Julie, if you want to connect with me, continue the conversations we're having here, or you know, really anything that we cover on this podcast, always open to that. Always happy to put listeners in touch with our guests. Reach out to me with a direct message on LinkedIn. That's probably the easiest way to reach me and, and always happy to have those conversations. That said, here is Julie Dirksen. Julie, welcome to the show. This is an interesting topic today. We think a lot about training and development and as far as what do we want people to know? But there's so much more that goes into setting up training. And there's a huge array of tools and processes and techniques and things you can use. And so actual learning design is its own thing, which I was not aware of until just a couple of years ago. But it's fascinating. And I'm excited to dive into it and pick it apart a little bit with you. Yeah, thank you. Happy to be here. Yeah, no, you know, I tell people I'm an instructional designer and I always get the, I almost always get the quizzical head tilt. Huh, no, 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 what that is. But it, but it is a whole field of trying to figure out how do you craft really good learning experiences. And there's a separation. So people who do it in the, the K-12 school age world are typically like curriculum and instruction people. And then when you design uh, learning experiences for either higher ed adults, you're, you're usually an instructional designer in that context. So yeah, it's a great field. I love it because I get to learn about everybody's subject matter. So it means I'm always learning something new, which makes me really happy. Yeah. I imagine you have to like learning to become an instructional designer. Yeah, I think it's I think it's probably one of those sort of core requirements. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, so I have a long list of questions in front of me because I enjoyed your book, Talk to the Elephant. But you just said something interesting that I want to unpack that's not there. I told you we were going to go down rabbit holes. Yep, so let's just sure. start with let's one. Let's do it. You talked about K through 12 being more curriculum focused, instructional design being more adult learning. Do adults and kids learn differently? Or is is there a reason those are different? Or should we be thinking about learning the same way, regardless of age? You know, it, they're more alike than they are different. People seem to think that, and I've noticed this because I've done some teacher training over the years. So teaching teachers how to use different curriculums, I've operated in that world because that is a workplace learning problem or challenge. And they always think that like adult learning is somehow different. I'm like, well, you know, really almost everything you learned about how to teach kids is going to still apply with adults for the most part. When it comes to K-12, though, there are some very specific things about like the developmental age of the child. So obviously expectations that you can have around the behavior of a kindergartner versus a second grader versus a seventh grader and things like that. And so having that context is really important, in addition to which I think curriculum and instruction for K-12 very rightly prioritizes people who have some experience with classroom and things like that. And I, I think that that absolutely all completely makes sense. You know, there's a lot, 
there's people whose whole world is specializing in sixth graders, for example, and understanding exactly where they are in their cycle, their sort of developmental life cycle, kind of what's going on and how do they best support kids of that age. And that's the thing that I think adult or workplace instructional designers, that's the context they often don't have. But honestly, you know, we talk about a lot of stuff like this is part of the one of the one of the more misguided fads of recent years has been generations and like generational learning and how what do millennials or Gen Z need? And I'm like, well, you know, honestly, they need the same thing as the, you know, the older, the older generations too. The older generations just might be a little bit more patient putting up with some of the stuff, but nobody, you know, everybody needs things that are relevant and things that they can apply and things that they can interact with and all of those kinds of things. So by and large, we're more alike than we are different, but you know, there are some specific considerations with kids. Yeah. It seems like maybe very young kids, there's some developmental stuff that they just haven't had. But it seems like once you get into maybe even as early as like kindergarten, first grade, second grade, if you can do that and hold their attention and tell relevant stories and make it relevant, like if you can learn the fundamentals, it seems like that would apply all the way up because we only get more patient as we get older. Not much, but a little bit, right? We <laughs> right. get more context. We get more patient. We understand the world more. So you can build out on that. But it's it would seem like if you can get the very base level of it at a young age, then you can do it with anybody. That would It would seem that way. Yeah. And there's a little bit of a long view too when it comes to say like K-12 curriculum planning, right? Because it's like what fundamentals of science education do we need to do with second graders in order for high school sophomores to be at a place where they can do, you know, the things that they need to be able to do. And so you get a little bit more of this, like, how are we bringing people along a kind of a longer curriculum path, which can happen in adult workplace, but adult workplace tends to be a little bit more like, here's the immediate need, right? We need all of these people to be able to use the new computer system when it drops next month. What do we need to do to get them there? And so it's not quite I won't say that you never take the long view in adult learning. Obviously, when we're training airline pilots or something, we've got a long view of what does it take to develop somebody's skills as a, as a pilot on this particular plane or something like that. But a lot of times we're more about meeting an immediate need than we are about like, how are we crafting kind of the whole development curve of oh, somebody's career or something like that. I love that. Very interesting. And, and we're thinking about, do we need this immediate or do we need do we need a more robust or longer term approach to this when you think about the problems you're trying to solve? So yeah, really interesting. All right. Well, thank you. We'll, we'll pick our heads out of that rabbit hole and get back to sort of the fundamentals of the book that we were set up to talk about. (laughs) And can you explain, let's just start with the title. Can you explain the metaphor of the elephant and the rider? And some people may have heard this before, but I think it's worth a refresher on what this is. And then what does this mean for how we learn? Yeah, absolutely. So the title of the book is Talk to the Elephant, Design Learning for Behavior Change. And the Talk to the Elephant part comes from this metaphor. It was originated by Jonathan Haidt, who's a psychologist who talks about, in a, in a book that he wrote in the 2000s called The Happiness Hypothesis, he talks about how your, your brain is like a rider and an elephant. And so if you think about, you know, kind of really big picture brain geography, like down towards your spinal cord, you kind of at the base of your skull, you get some of the really most basic functions like breathing and heart rate and reflexes, you know, stuff that that we've had from an evolutionary point of view for a really long time. Then we get things like gross motor control, kind of fine motor control, hearing, vision, all of this kind of stuff that's about perceiving and making sense of your physical environment and the world that you're in. And moving around, you know, like moving around in this environment and picking things up and tapping on your keyboard or whatever it is. And then right in the middle of your brain, you get the things like the amygdala and the hypothalamus that sort of parts of the limbic system, which are generally considered to be emotions, fight or flight, emotional reactions. You get things that regulate hormone release for, you know, emotional control and all of this kind of thing. So big, huge amount of like kind of your brain real estate is taken up with your sort of visceral perception and interaction with the world immediately right around you and things like emotion and feelings and all of that kind of stuff. And that's all stuff that we kind of consider to be the elephant. And then sitting right on front, you know, kind of right behind your eyes is this sort of most recently evolved part of our brain. It's the prefrontal cortex. It's things like that. And I'm vastly simplifying brain brain anatomy, being very hand wavy here, but 
it's generally where we do things like logic, reason, impulse control. It's the part that activates when we're projecting out into the future and considering consequences, dealing with abstractions, all of those kinds of things. So in hate's metaphor, we've got this big elephant, which is physical, emotional stuff. And then we've got a little rider sitting on top of it that is, you know, logic and reasoning and, you know, impulse control and executive function and all that kind of fun stuff. And so basically most models of decision making have this sort of dual, you know, whether, you, whether you've got Daniel Kahneman's thinking fast and slow, system one, system two, or, you know, there's a number of other ones that sort of have this like, here's my visceral automatic It's where habits execute, where you do things without thinking about it. That's kind of our elephant. And then we've got our sort of slow down, think about it, reason through it, rational, quote unquote, decision maker, which is our rider. And so we have these two things that are making decisions. And the example I always give is, what do you do when your alarm goes off in the morning? And there's always this sort of, not always, but... (laughs) I'd say a lot of the time there's a little bit of, I can either get out of bed and then maybe it's winter and it's cold and it's uncomfortable and it's dark and I don't want to, or I can hit the snooze button, right? And so your your rider is saying, okay, if I get up now, I'll have time to make a decent breakfast. I'll be able to like get myself sorted before I'm going to jump on this podcast. I'll be able to like run through my notes before a meeting, whatever, whatever, you know, sort of planning ahead to consider the or I won't hit the I won't hit the big traffic on the commute or whatever it is. And your elephant is like, oh, warm, comfortable, nice. Yeah. You know. No thanks. Let's, let's stay here. So like that, anybody who's who's ever had to kind of struggle with that decision, that's very much a rider versus elephant kind of thing. And your rider is often, you know, like you should get up and your elephant's like, nope. And if you really know that like if you don't get up, you're not gonna, you know, get to the airport on time for that trip, of course you're gonna get up. But if you've got a little bit of wiggle room, sometimes the elephant wins and the rider's like, well, we'll just skip the second cup of coffee and we'll make it work, right? And so that's always this sort of push-pull whenever we're dealing with any kind of decision. And I think of it a little bit, I don't know how much I got into this in the book, but honestly, it's almost all of our challenges around behaviors, which from my point of view as a learning person, I always describe the problem as they know what to do, but they still aren't doing it. Like they know they're supposed to update the client record or they know that they're supposed to attend the meeting about their benefits at the beginning of the year and not wait till the last minute to figure out what to do with, you know, their health savings account or whatever it is. The the issue there is that often any behavior change challenge that we're dealing with has kind of delayed consequences, delayed or absent feedback to it. Mm -hmm. And so it's a case where your immediate world is telling you one thing, like, you should stay in bed, it's nice here. But your intellectual knowledge, which is about projecting out of the future, considering abstractions or considering consequences, is like, nope, we really shouldn't, we should get up. You know, like saving for retirement is a big one, right? We all know that we should save for retirement and that bad things will happen if we don't save for retirement. But honestly, when you're 22 and you're in your first job, nothing bad happens if you don't save for retirement. Right. Yeah. And the bad thing that's going to happen Nothing bad happens is, if you don't save for retirement up until you retire. Right. You know, exactly. that, that it's so hard because you can plod right, that elephant can plod right along until you're 65, 67. And then all of a sudden you're in a really bad spot. Yeah. So my world is telling me I'm okay, like my physical environment and things like that. But intellectually, I'm like, that's not okay. It's not okay. Right. Yeah. And so one of the things that, the research has, has suggested about encouraging people to save for retirement is, is one, you, you make it so easy that the elephant doesn't even notice. You know, like if you just kind of sign up for that automatic deduction and you never see the money, the elephant's never like, hey, we could spend that. You know, I mean, it's just gone and you don't have to think about it. And that's yeah. probably the best answer in most cases. The other thing is, is if they can really, there's a researcher in Stanford whose stuff I love, Jeremy Billinson and his lab, the Virtual Human Interaction Laboratory. And they did the thing where they will have you walk around a virtual reality environment as your like 65 year old self. Mm. So, you, and you, you, they've got mirrors in there so you can kind of see yourself. And they do that thing where they kind of, you know, automatically age you up. Then they looked at the question of if you had spent time as your 65 year old self in this VR environment, are you more likely to save for retirement? And it turns out, yeah, you are actually. 
you're more likely wow. to sort of have some empathy for your 65 year old self yeah. um, if you've had that kind of visceral experience. So that makes me think, have you seen the Disney show Limitless with Chris Hemsworth? Yes. Yeah. The so episode they that, where they, yeah, they did that to him where they actually put him in a suit that limited his mobility so he could feel what it was going to be like to be 80 plus years old. And then spoiler alert, they brought his, his wife in and put her in prosthetics. So she looked like she was about 70 years old and then they had, you know, like a date night. And it was, I mean, you could see a lot of that show, you could see him, like, he's a big, strong guy. He's done some wild stuff. So they like put him in a couple scenarios and you're like, he's built (laughs) for this. But you could tell seeing his wife like that and seeing, Mm -hmm. being frustrated by his own limitations in the age suit, like you could tell that that had an impact. Yeah. And they use, there's a suit that was created by, it's the MIT like technology group. It's called the Agnes suit. And I don't remember what it's an acronym, but I don't remember what it's for but they'll use it for medical students because mm. if you've got medical students treating an elderly, like geriatric, if they're doing a geriatric medicine rotation, they'll have them do things like navigate the hospital wearing one of these. And they've got glasses so it simulates the kind of vision limitations and things like that. Because otherwise you get, you know, you've got your little 25 year old intern who's like, come with me and starts charging down the hall. And, you know, you, you get a patient who can't, who can't move that fast, um, yeah. you know, or things like that. There's a lot of that, that degree of empathy has been mapped in some of the research to better clinical outcomes. So it's not just like nice to have stuff. It actually, you know, can potentially improve care when we help people understand what, what somebody else is experiencing in that case. There's like, for example, there's a whole series of eyeglasses you can put on that'll simulate different vision conditions and they use it to train like ophthalmologists and things like that. Yeah. So, all right, I'm going to put a pin in that because I have some questions <laughs> around around that stuff, but I feel like that's maybe 301 and we're still down at the 101 yeah, yeah, level. Yeah, so let's, absolutely. we we talked about building training over time. Let's build this episode a little bit over time, over the hour that we have. For anyone who's interested in fleshing out what you had talked about around defaults, I mean, you can look look up behavioral economics, you can look up defaults, you can look up nudges, you can look up the concept of choice architecture, all is kind of geared towards the same thing, which is how do we set up the environment so that people make the easiest decision. You talked about great examples in 401k programs, automatic enrollment, automatic escalation of savings in grocery stores, putting the healthiest food at eye level, some things like that. So if people want to research that, they can. A lot of what you just talked about, though, is our ability to choose the intellectual decision that we want. And so there's this element of delayed gratification. And and you kind of hinted at it, but it it was a question I was going to ask anyway. Like so much of our ability to be successful is our ability to delay our gratification to a later date. How does that play into corporate training? Like how, how should folks who are designing training at work think about delayed gratification and behavior change and helping people improve that ability? Yeah. Well, you know, a lot of times we're asking people to sit through training for something that they're not going to use for a really long time. That is always going to be a challenge. And so there's some, there's a few ways around that, right? So one of the things I'm obsessed with, and you were, you were alluding to a lot of this stuff from behavioral economics, there's a particular behavioral economics concept that I'm entirely obsessed with. It's hyperbolic or temporal discounting. So, and the way that I can explain that is, is basically it's, it's this sort of preference for immediate versus delayed rewards. But if I asked you, if I was handing out money, and this is, I promise not a trick question. If I said, I can either give you $10 or $11, which one would you take? $11. $11, right. And, And everybody would for the most part. If I said then, though, would you rather have $10 today or $11 tomorrow? Which one would you take? $11 tomorrow. Yeah. And I get about 50, 50, 60, 40 on that one when I ask like a big group of people. So about half the people are like, no, I'll take the $10 today. And about half people are like, no, $11 tomorrow. I'm willing to wait. All right. $10 today or $11 in a year. Which one would you take? So I cheated because I've read the book. So I'm going to go... My gut would be, well, just give me the $10 now. But yeah. if I, again, so my elephant probably goes, give me the $10 now. My rider goes, I'll take $11 in a year. 
Yeah, absolutely. And when I ask a room with, you know, 50 people in it, I'll get 49 people who say, I'll take the $10 today. And one person who says, I'll take the $11 in a year. And then they want to talk to me about interest rates. Yeah, that was, Um, well, so that was where my head went when I was reading it in the book. And I was like, oh, I'm just an Uber nerd. Okay, great. No, no, you know, like I said, fair, totally fair. Hey, you know, interest rates are good right now. So it's a timely topic, but The deal with that is when we think about it from a learning point of view, usually if we really think about the reward for learning something, you know, it could be a certificate or a checkmark or a completion, but those are kind of extrinsic. Usually the more more intrinsic or more intrinsic leaning reward for learning something is getting to do something with that information. So whenever we're asking people to learn things that they can't use, right? So I mentioned uh, health savings accounts, right, which is a delightful American invention to try to deal with our insurance system. If you have any international listeners, they may or may not be familiar. If I'm at the beginning of the year trying to make you listen to a training about how to use your health savings account, which you have to use by you know December 31st, it's going to be harder for people to care about that and harder for people to allocate attention to it than that that same information in mid-December where they're going, shoot, I still have $500 left. I got to spend it. Can I use it for eyeglasses or, you know, whatever the, whatever the question is. And so one of the things that we look at for training purposes is, can I move the point of learning closer to the point of use? So instead of making you sit through a class in January, can I make an on-demand class available for whenever you need to deal with your health savings account? You can pull this up and it'll have like the five-minute video that explains the guidelines and away you go. And that's probably the best answer in a lot of these cases is moving the point of use closer to the point of need for somebody. I'm going to use this immediately. Like if you're pulling up YouTube to learn how to fix a dripping faucet because you have a dripping faucet, it's not hard to allocate your attention to that. I'll sometimes also ask the question, and again, it's in the book, but, you know, people's level of interest in watching a five minute video on printer repair and everybody's like zero, I have zero interest in watching a video on printer repair. And then, but then I'm like, okay, your printer's broken and you have to print a super important form and get it in the mail by midnight. What, what's your level now of interest now? And they're like, oh, 10, right? And so it's not that the video changed in those scenarios because we think sometimes, well, it's about creating really engaging learning materials. But like, it's not like we added unicorns and dancing cats to the second video. It's just that somebody had a purpose for it. And now, now they're more than willing to pay attention to it. And so one of the things we can do is the, the third question I'll always ask is, okay, I put a broken printer down on the table in front of you. And I said, hey, our task in this class is to fix this printer. Now, what's your level of interest in fixing, watching a five-minute video on printer repair? And people are like, oh, six, seven, you know? And it's not a real problem. They don't have a real document they need to send, but I've just given you an interesting challenge to figure out. And now, all of a sudden, it's way easier for people to allocate their attention. I don't love all of the myths that are floating out there about our attention spans because I I don't think they actually change that much. (laughs) Um, people can, you know, it, it's shorter than a goldfish thing. Like if you want, if you want to know the history on the whole goldfish myth, I am happy to, to go through that one. But b- bottom line is people are binging 10 hours of Netflix shows, you know, like there's fundamentally, I think no upward limit to our attention spans. If it's something we're interested in, it's not like if our attention waned after, 10 minutes, nobody would be able to finish a TV show. You know, like that's, yeah. it's kind of nonsensical to think that that there is this sort of upward limit of attention. What I do think there may be a limit to is how long we can force ourselves to pay attention reasonably. You know, like if I'm reading through my tech stuff, you know, I'm lucky to make it to 10 minutes before I like need a cookie or something. But if you want, you know, if it's if you're interested and you want to pay attention, then there doesn't seem to be any limit. Now, we all have incredibly divided attention these days. We're operating in an environment where there's 9 million demands. And so stopping and focusing can sometimes be really hard and helping people with, you know, ways to do that. But giving somebody an immediate use for something is one of the best ways to make it easier for them to focus. And a lot of it comes down to is the rider dragging the elephant along, which is clearly what's happening when I'm trying to deal with my taxes. Mm -hmm. My elephant has zero desire to participate in this. My rider is like, nope, 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 we got to focus. 
And so when the two are at odds, when they really want to go in different directions, I do think there's a limit to how long you can kind of force yourself to stay engaged with something. And so our best bet in terms of strategies for this is, like I said, either move the learning closer to the point of use, but sometimes you can't, right? Like you don't want people watching the three minute video on how to evacuate the building when they need to evacuate the building. (laughs) You have to do that ahead of time. Yeah. Right. But can you make, can you create some sense of urgency or some, you know, some way to make it engage the elephant in that process. And so that's really fundamentally what the book title is about talking to the elephant. We have a tendency to talk to the writer. We have a tendency to use the logical, rational, often abstract, often future benefit to something, as opposed to putting the printer right down in front of them, which is a thing I can touch and see and deal with. And it's an immediate challenge and stuff. And so all of a sudden my elephant's playing along, basically. Yeah. So, all right. So I want to go back to the pin I had set before which is the concept of experiential education. And Mm -hmm. I have been involved with a nonprofit in Chicago called Embark. The founder has been on this show and they create experiential education field trips. They call them journeys for underserved high school students throughout the city of Chicago. And Mm -hmm. it has a tremendous impact. And so that really, I've been been very involved with that organization. The concept of experiential education has really caught my attention. And I've just in paying attention to the things that I enjoy, the things that my children enjoy, how learning is most enjoyed and best processed. It seems like this concept of experiential learning just like blows everything else away. How do you feel about this concept of experiential learning and like, how do you define it and how should we think about it? I I mean, mostly I love it. Mostly I think it's great. I think there are some specific considerations that we need to kind of figure into. For example, one of the things that happened a lot for a while is you would do these workshops where, you know, the whole company would go learn oh gosh, a team building activity where they would be put into a simulated thing where your plane crashes in the Gobi Desert and you have to like figure out what supplies you're going to take with you and da, 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 da. And you learn this process for kind of prioritizing or whatever, whatever. And my struggle with those is they were very experiential and I think they were pretty engaging while you were doing it. The chan- The question was how much of that actually transferred back into people's practice. And so one of the things you know, 100% thumbs up on experiential learning, but I do think you need to also have a clear sense of how is this going to map back into application. Mm -hmm. So what you're talking about with the Embark stuff, I think a lot of the goal, I'm just guessing, but I would suspect that a lot of goals around that are things like expanding their understanding of even what's possible. You know, maybe it's possible career paths or things like that. You hit it right on the head. Yeah. Yeah. Also some self-efficacy, right? Like, I think I'm interested in a career in cybersecurity, but I don't know anything about it. I don't know anybody who's ever done it. I don't know what this looks like. You know, like that feels too daunting. I guess I'm just going to go over here and take a general business course, right? As opposed to, oh, I got to go to a place where somebody showed me and the people that, who were there didn't look like, you know, the people who do this on TV. They look like normal people. And I think I could actually do this. And so, one of the things we look at a lot in you know the behavior change space is things like a sense of self-efficacy, a sense of capability, you know, all of those kinds of things. And so whatever we're doing with experiential learning, I just think we need to be able to tie it into these sort of bigger picture goals. Because we there's been um there was a trend, I think it was very big like in the 70s and into the 80s and stuff around like exploring, exploratory learning. We're just gonna let these kids explore, you know, and the outcomes from that weren't necessarily always great. So it Mm -hmm. has to, it has to ultimately tie back into, okay, well, what are we actually going to do with this? But that's, so that's not a criticism of, of the concept of experiential learning. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. But it does need to be, it's not just like throw experiences out there. There does need to be this sort of being a bit deliberate about it and figuring out how it ties in. So like, for example, my simulation, you know, where your your simulated Gobi Desert challenge, like the way that you could make use of that is here I learned the method doing this fun, cool activity, but now we're going to do a practice with a real world situation that I actually would deal with at work. 
And then my manager is going to mentor me through using this same process over the next, say, six weeks to make sure that it actually all makes its way back into my work practice and, you know, things like that. Yeah. So it's funny that you say that because we're in the process of building an event for heads of HR for summer of 2024, where we are going to be teaching experience design and design thinking skills that they can take back. Uh, We're going to use a real world scenario to put them through this sort of experiential learning. And then we're going to have moments of reflection where they think about what the, how this translates back to their work. So little little teaser, little plug there. There'll be more to come on that as the year progresses. But yeah, I think that kind of learning can be really impactful as long as you can, to your point, make it tangible and mm-hmm. and then show the translation back. Yeah. Yeah. Or you, you know, there are there's plenty of technical trainings that need to happen where there's an actual skill that you can practice. So you had mentioned VR and AR, virtual reality and augmented reality. I had wanted to ask you about this. So we can go there now. How do you see organizations using those technologies most effectively? And I guess maybe just let's just start by what are each of those terms for people who right. aren't sure, especially with augmented reality? Like what are the yeah. terms and how do you see companies starting to use them? Right. So virtual reality is obviously what I think people mostly picture you put on the goggles and you're in the Tron bicycle race or something like that, you know, or you're playing Beat Saber or whatever it is, but you, you know, you can, you, you're in the immersive environment, right? And those are kind of interesting because of that kind of attention, divided attention problem. I mean, people are typically not going to classrooms anymore. They're typically doing like a lot of virtual online, except one of the problems with virtual online is you're still in your workplace with all your, all your other stuff kind of hovering just behind that next tab. And so one of the interesting things about VR is being able to kind of, again, create a little bit of an attention bubble around people and kind of preserve, preserve it for their learning experience. The cost for developing VR training has been high enough that it typically has mostly been used in things like dangerous scenarios, right? So we want to train firefighters. It's dangerous and expensive to put them into real fires right out of the classroom or whatever it is. So, you know, can we use can we use VR for some of these kinds of things as a safer, more easily replicable format for things? Like I want to show you specifically what this kind of fire situation looks like, I'm trying to recreate that over and over again, even, I mean, and firefighters do have these literal physical buildings where they can set stuff on fire and things like that, but that's expensive and it's challenging. And so, you know, can we use VR in some of those scenarios or things where things where it's either dangerous or very expensive or just difficult to organize or engineer? So those have typically been the the reasons why we're, we see VR implementations. Like I said, the cost of authoring for VR has been quite high. And so it tends to get reserved for stuff like that. One of the interesting things with the new kind of interest in the AI stuff is I'm I'm going to be interested to see whether or not some of the AI tools will allow us to design much faster for virtual reality environments. And then we may actually finally kind of get over the, cross the chasm on VR as a common training tool, because even though we've had it for quite a while, it's still a little bit esoteric. Now, augmented reality is when we kind of put some sort of overlay over the real world. So it's not that completely immersive reality where everything else gets blocked out. It's instead, it was basically the idea behind Google Glass. And that's been one of the challenges for augmented reality is to have a good wearable that really seems to to hit the right sweet spot in terms of supporting performance without being an additional distraction. So you would put on goggles and maybe it would like play the the steps for repairing the HVAC system, you know, up here while you're repairing the HVAC system down here. Yeah. So for, you would for be folks able- who want the like most modern view of this, at least that I've seen is you can go to Apple and look at their goggles, mm-hmm. like the video, they have a great video promoing their very expensive goggles that are both AR and VR mm-hmm. capable, but there's I, there's like one scene where a guy's working on his computer and he's like sitting in his room and his computer screen is like just hanging in the middle of his room like a sci-fi movie. Or yeah. he's sitting with his 
partner watching a theater size movie screen, but it feels like they're sitting in their room. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So like the, we, we've known for decades that these technologies have these amazing capabilities. And so it's really, we're kind of still in the, the upward climb in terms of being able to fully implement it and, and things like if the authoring gets much easier with the AI and as the technology gets better. So this, the Apple headset, which I saw go by, but I had not watched that video, but I had it bookmarked is one of those, one of those big steps. And fortunately, the part of the good news is that the gaming industry keeps advancing the technology for us because if we were driving it entirely from like education and training and stuff like that, we'd still be, I don't know, using yeah. Google Cardboard or something like that. Unfortunately, most technology gets driven forward by gaming and pornography. <laughs> hey, right. Those two things. Um, yeah. yeah. And so we still haven't gotten to the sort of broad adoption of these things, but so many of the technology pieces are starting to fall into place so that I think it's coming. It's yeah. coming. So well, I heard, I was listening to a futurist who spoke at my organization's annual meeting and he had good perspective, which is a lot of new technology, especially revolutionary technology, gets poo-pooed in the beginning because it sucks, right? It, it doesn't work. It's so expensive. It's clunky. Like, why would anybody do this? But if you just think this is version 1.0, yeah. what will version 12.0 look like? Mm-hmm. I think you start to go like, oh, okay, maybe this is a trend I should be paying attention to. I don't need to buy it right now, but I should at least be thinking about it because the world, like technology continues to progress. So whatever you're seeing right now in its clunky form will likely get to a 2.0 and a 3.0 and a 4.0. Like we're already with chat GPT, I think on four or 5.0. And the first, you know, if any of us in the public had seen 1.0, we'd have laughed, we'd have laughed at it. But then 3.0 came out and we were like, oh my God, this is the craziest thing we've ever seen in the world. And, you know, we're going to get to 20.0 in a flash, you know, years, a couple of years are going to go by and suddenly it's, it's going to be an incredible technology. And that's, I think, going to be the same with some of these other things. It only speeds up. The next N.0 is going to come faster than the last one. Mm -hmm. I don't, I just... He was talking about that and it just totally shifted how I think about yeah. oh, absolutely. looking at the technologies that we have available today. I wrote a white paper. It's, uh, it's freely available on the Learning Guild website about behavior change applications for augmented and virtual reality too. And you mm. know, a lot of it was the work that, like I said, that was out of Jeremy Bellinson's lab at Stanford and things like that. But you know, they, there are kind of some big themes that we see in that space. And again, it's going to depend on cost and availability of technology and stuff. One of the problems with virtual reality that doesn't get talked about very much when people are sort of talking about it for training purposes is you need a safe physical environment for people to do that stuff. And that's a little, you know, like if you're in VR, you're kind of vulnerable because you're sort of blind to the outside world. You look kind of dorky too. And so having good physical environments for people to go participate in in that as a training thing is actually one of the considerations that you really need to make sure that you're thinking about as well as yeah. the what's happening inside the goggles and stuff like you that. Can, uh, you can go to YouTube and look at VR fails and <laughs> yeah. watch people smash their TVs or break their arms or whatever by mm-hmm. doing it in the wrong space without the right safety and constraints. So yeah, that, that is important. Yeah. But the the augmented reality or the virtual and augmented reality for behavior change are things like adding feedback mechanisms. There's some really interesting uses of augmented reality for that. My favorite was this tiny little pilot study done by a researcher, I believe in Japan, who created a virtual fish tank that was tied to your to- your like an electric toothbrush. And if you brushed your teeth for the full time that you're supposed to brush your teeth, like the algae would get cleared away. And if you did it every day, day after day, more fish would be in your fish tank. And I'm like, well, that's super delightful and would totally yeah. work on me. I had a hundred percent want my little virtual fish tank to be like packed full of cool fish. Would we call that gamification? Would that yeah, fall under that bit. category? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. yeah, it would be. Yeah. And gamification is an interesting, you know, and it, that's, that's a whole nother rabbit hole, but but I mean, that was, everybody thought that was going to be an amazing solution to everything. 
when that first came out as well. And the truth is, you know, it's a very mixed bag. There's good, there's, uh, there's good and bad gamification. Bad gamification is this sort of over-reliance on extrinsic rewards, like points and whatever, points, badges thing where, you know, it kind of doesn't matter. I listened to a lot of audiobooks and the Audible app had these like badges for a while that you could get like, you're on a streak. You listen to audiobooks three days in a row or you listen to audiobooks a lot on weekends. And I'm like, these badges are literally meaningless to me. Like they, the reasons I listen to audiobooks are either entertainment or enlightenment. And these, the idea that I should, you know, be motivated by the fact that I listen to it a lot on the weekend doesn't, like those two things have nothing to do with each other, right? Yeah. You know, if it had given me a badge for listening to like five neuroscience books, because I was listening to, I was, I was doing a lot of reading in the neuroscience space for a while, that might have been at least tied to what my intrinsic goals were for listening to these audiobooks. But I'm never going to be like, I should listen to a few more minutes so that I can get a, a listen to on the weekend badge. Like, yeah, it's just so bad gamification actually can be demotivating. Can you talk about what is extrinsic versus intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation and how should training or education designers be thinking about them, broadly speaking, when building out corporate training? Yeah, there's different motivation frameworks and things like that. The one that I prefer and I think the one that's kind of one of the more dominant ones, it has a good research base, is self-determination theory. And it sort of says, well, sometimes somebody can be amotivated, right? And a motivation could be a product of they just don't care, but it could also be a product of there's no reason for them to be interested. So if you think about your Embark experiential learning things, you may have kids who are completely amotivated about technology careers until you take them on one of these experiences and they go, wow, that actually looks interesting and cool. And then you sort of move them from amotivated into, you know. Uh, and so if we took them from amotivated and you sold them on technology careers because they pay well, that would be sort of that fully extrinsic external motivation. Like I'm not interested in technology for its own sake, but boy, I like the idea of a well-paying job. And there's nothing wrong with wanting a well-paying job. But the problem with it, if you focused entirely on external motivators, which are so the motivators that are outside of people, the motivation only lasts as long as you're kind of constantly feeding the reward, right? Mm -hmm. So if I give a kids a dollar every time they draw a picture, then um, what happens is, and there's been some studies on this and stuff, what happens is the kids will figure out how to draw the simplest picture possible to get the dollar. Whereas before I started paying them to draw pictures, they might've been drawing these cool, elaborate, like my, my, one of my God kids drew this thing that was like a whole Minecraft world, but he had drawn it out and he could tell you the entire story of how you'd like navigate. And there's a pit with spikes and you have to swing over and do, you know, he'd spent, an hour on this picture. Well, as soon as we in introduce the external motivator, all of a sudden we make the point of the game, like drawing pictures, and then you get a picture of a circle, you know, or like a picture of a tree, doom, 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 you know, and stuff like that. Yeah. And so we want to be careful with external motivation. You know, nobody's going to go to a job where they don't get paid. So it's not like it has no role. <laughs> um, but at the same time, if that's all you're using to motivate behavior is this external reward, then, eh, you know, yeah. Well, um, the other it, thing it, it, that I always found to be really sad when it comes to that kind of external reward is so let's take your drawing example. You know, not only do the drawings get simpler, once you stop paying them, they stop drawing. Yeah. And you can, you can take a kid who loved reading or loved drawing and you can introduce an external reward. And then if you do it for long enough and then you take it away, that kid who loved to read or loved to draw suddenly doesn't love it anymore. You've actually mm -hmm. like killed their desire for the thing, which is, I remember reading that. I forget which book it was in. It was in one of the pop psychology books that's out there mm -hmm. uh, that a lot of people have read. I just can't remember which one. Yeah, it's in a few, um, probably Daniel Pink's Drive is the one yeah. that kind of digs into this the most. There's also a book by Alfie Cohn called Punished by Rewards that, that gets into mm -hmm. all this because you're absolutely right, 100%. Yeah. yeah. The, and I, you know, I mean, part can, of what we do at my company is help organizations with their compensation programs. And there is a conversation when we talk about incentive comp to be really careful that we are incentivizing the right things 
and not o- not over incentivizing behaviors to create this dynamic that we're talking about where people are only doing something because they're getting paid and they're going to do the minimum threshold and they're not going to pay attention to safety standards or when the reward goes away or doesn't increase that they don't suddenly stop doing the behavior. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. And so in the in the book I used um hand washing posters because we all obviously just went through our whole whole world of hand washing. You know, like if it's the wash your hands, otherwise there's a penalty or a punishment or whatever it is, that's an external, you know, external punishment in this case, not a reward. But then people do it as long as they feel like they're being watched or monitored or whatever. And you, you know, you don't want that. You want them to do it no matter whether somebody's watching or not, right? Like that's because otherwise you you're just getting compliance when somebody's looking and not, you know, not the rest of the time. We can move it over a little bit and go to things like it's interjected, which is guilt or shame or flattery. You know, I have friends who have kids who, you know, are learning musical instruments and getting them to practice is it's a little bit of a challenge sometimes. And obviously the best possible world is when the kid loves music and wants to practice it themselves. But, you know, kids being kids, sometimes they need a little bit of external structure and things like that. But, but I, you know, I see my friends trying to be very careful of not being too much about punishment or bribery or any of those kinds of things. Cause then that does do exactly what you talked about with drawing, where it turns it into something that feels onerous. And the minute their parents stop leaning on them, they want to stop. And, you know, and you, you don't want that with this, you want this to be something you know, that they enjoyed and all the way over to the intrinsic. My friend Mark plays the guitar and he literally doesn't care if anybody listens to him. You know, he's not doing it for any big thing. He just really loves, like he is a very happy person if he can sit home on the couch on a Saturday and play his guitar for a couple hours. Like that just is delightful to him. And that's that fully intrinsic, like this is something I love that I want to do. Now, not everything in the world is going to be like that. Like there's no intrinsic form of motivation for hand washing that I know of. I tried to make a poster about it being a 20 second spa break in your day because I couldn't find one. So I made one up and I, I don't think that quite works, but you know, yeah. maybe if you could try to really like, this is my time for your 20 <laughs> seconds of hand washing. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, but you can move the message from a compliance you have to, you're being forced, there's penalties over into, hey, you're doing this for, you know, if you're in healthcare, you're doing this for your patients. You know, I once had a nurse practitioner, we were talking about a hand washing curriculum and she said, you know, sometimes it's hard to do the whole 20 seconds. And she's like, I think I'm a good nurse. I can do this. And I'm like, that is the most compelling in- invocation of like values. You know, her sense of identity and values around being a good nurse were the motivation she was using to wash her hands for that extra 10 seconds. Cause you know, and part of the problem with hand washing, right. Is what we talked about before, which is delayed or absent feedback. You know, most of the time in healthcare, if you're washing your hands, they don't look any different before or after. It's very intellectual to know about germ theory. So that's a hundred percent rider. Your elephant's like, I don't get it. Why are we doing this? Right. And also it's really hard to connect the action of not washing your hand up to a consequence, because if you don't wash your hands at like three o'clock on Thursday, a patient could get an infection, but you will almost certainly not be able to draw a dotted line between that action and that outcome. Yeah, You know, you'll never know that it was you not washing your hands at three o'clock on Thursday that caused a particular patient to have an infection. It's just not realistic in, you know, healthcare settings and things like that to have that kind of information. And so even though intellectually all these healthcare providers know that this is a really crucial part of providing good care, they still need to kind of remind themselves over and over again about the importance of it. And, you know, a lot of the hand-washing compliance improvements in the U.S. over the last few decades has been about changing the environment, making it easier to wash hands as you walk into the room, having the access to the alcohol-based hand rubs, you know, all of these kinds of things that make it easier to do, to do a thing. So it sounds really simple, wash your hands for 20 seconds. And yet we know that everybody's operating in these complex systems and sometimes it's not as easy as, as it sounds. So. Yeah. I have one kind of nuanced question here regarding what, what we're talking about with behavior change. You drew a line in the book between individual behavior change and group behavior change. Mm -hmm. 
Can you talk a little bit to the difference or at least how we should be thinking about the difference when we're thinking about training one person to do something versus a group of people to do something? Yeah. I mean, one of the questions whenever you're dealing with a behavior change that you should sort of always ask kind of upfront is if this person changes their behavior, will they be able, they themselves be able to see the outcome of that change, right? And so if I start saving for retirement in my 401k, you know, is it going to be compelling? Maybe, maybe not. But will I be able to see, you know, yeah, I will. I'll be able to go out to the pay, you know, the web the dashboard web page for my 401k account and see the numbers tick up, right? And whether that feedback's meaningful or not, you know, but but nonetheless, I will be able to see the outcome of my behavior as an individual. The problem with retirement savings is there's always this sort of perpetual question of like, is this enough? What is this going to really look like when I retire? Is this genuinely, you know, should I be saving more? Is, you know, can I, can I afford to save a little less? You know, whatever. But I still can see the results of myself as an individual. But then when we start to get into other behaviors where you can only measure the impact at a group or a system level, those are going to be much harder to deal with. So the hand-washing one is an example, right? Like I will never see individual behavioral results from my hand-washing, right? I will almost certainly never know that my action caused this particular problem in the system. What we will be able to see is that we've our infection rate on the ward is higher than it should be or higher than it has been or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then we might be able to see it at an aggregate system level. Our infection rate as a hospital doesn't is higher or lower than like other kind of similar hospital systems in in the area, assuming that this data is collectible and, and accessible publicly and things like that. So whenever we've got those kinds of things, then we need to really look at these challenges. So for example, a lot of the, um, one of the big topics obviously right now is, you know, DEI efforts, right? One of the examples I pick out in the book, I don't want to, I don't want to wade into the whole DEI morass, but one of the specific, one of the challenges with a lot of DEI efforts is whether or not they've got concrete behaviors attached to them. A lot of times they're attitudinal and that's its own separate problem, but but if they've got concrete behavior, so let's say there's an outcome that you want from your DEI effort, which is you want managers to be making fair and equitable salary offers to candidates and not have salary offers that are influenced by race or gender or any of those kinds of things, right? I don't know if I've ever seen that as a stated goal for a DEI program, but in theory, we, we would want that, right? We no. would want salary offers to be to be fair and equitable and not reflect bias based on, you know, assuming that somebody has the same qualifications, all this kind of stuff, right? Well, you know, like typically salary offers operate in a little bit in a vacuum, right? So I think some big corporations, and you, you've talked about how you do incentive, you know, you advise people on this kind of stuff. So you probably actually know more than I do about what kind of the current state of some of that is in industries, but it's like we're dealing with a small company that doesn't have a really extensive system about it. And you've only offered this job, like this job only gets filled once every two, three years, right? What's the likelihood that you're going to have enough data as the person offering a salary, making a salary offer on this job to yeah. know whether or not it's reflecting bias, right? Because the bias doesn't necessarily show up in that individual instance. It shows up when this person gets compared to several other people in the same role or gets compared, you know, industry-wide across things. Like one of the organizations that had the lowest level of salary bias is the U.S. Post Office because it has such clear guidelines for you've worked here this long, you get paid this, those kinds of things. And there's still some that creeps in, but but by and large, you know, because there's so little judgment involved in what people get paid, it's all spelled out in the guidelines, you don't see the same kind of gaps in this. But, you know, like, and none of this is managers trying to be bad people, which is sometimes a message that's super frustrating to me when it does show up in DEI efforts that like, if you were doing this, if you were trying to be a good manager, you could fix this stuff. And sometimes it's like, no, you can't because you literally don't have enough information in your role right there to do this well, be sure, right? Um, and so does that then require more like organizational, like process solutions than like training that manager to be better? 
Yes. Is that kind of where we're going with this? Okay. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Salesforce.com did a massive audit of all of their salary stuff and they wound up having to spend $3 million doing salary adjustments to deal with things that were not explainable by anything other than potentially race or gender bias. And they've done it several times. I think they're, I don't know what, you know, what dollar amount they're up to right now. But it's actually turned into kind of a constant ongoing effort because they acquired companies and things like that. Those companies brought their own kind of issues into play. And, you know, one of the things I like about this is it moves away from the the bad acting individual explanation for this stuff. Yeah, You know, these things happen at a systems level. And so if an individual can't get feedback on their individual actions often they are not in a position where they're going to be able to change things. And so you do need to look at a group or at a system level to make sure that those things are being accounted for, those things are being tracked, those things are being monitored. And so it's not realistic. You know, like if I focus on an individual behavior, like sorting my recycling, right? I try, I try real hard to do it right. I'm not confident I'm a hundred percent. But fundamentally, like my, whether or not I throw away that yogurt container is actually going to matter less than if there's a secondary market for recycled plastics or if the systems that are set up to recycle those plastics. And ultimately that's going to matter less than if there are incentives on the manufacturing side to create, to use materials that are more easily recycled or that are things like that. And so one of the, the caution points we always kind of do is, Yes, we, we do need to zoom in on the individual behaviors and we do need to look at solutions there, but we also need to ask the question of, is this person getting enough feedback to continue to act on this? And is there something that we need to be doing at a group or a system level to support it? Yeah, well, and in the book, you talk about other things too. You know, is this a systems problem? Is it mistrust problem? Is it, are, are people on autopilot? Is it, is there some learned helplessness involved? There's like, there's a bunch of other things that you talk about in the book about defining what the actual problem is because there can be a lot of things going on that you want to solve as a business leader that training's not going to help you with because yeah. it's not just that the individual doesn't know what they're doing. It's that there's something else going on that's causing that problem. And so I think that's one of the things I like around design thinking frameworks is it forces mm-hmm. you to start at the very beginning and understanding the situation so that you can then define the right problem. And most of us just go, oh, we have this problem. Let's start thinking about solutions. And we don't back up and say, okay, what is, what's leading to this problem? And let's, let's spend some time figuring out how we want to approach this versus just like, what's the right solution? Yeah, well, and that's that's kind of, you know, when I teach this as a one-day workshop, I wind up spending about 75% of the day focused on di- like appropriately diagnosing the problem. And then honestly, solutions get a little bit of a short shrift. I kind of send them off with tools and be like, oh, you'll figure it out, but which is not quite right. I, I need to figure out how to do that as a two-day, but I think the bigger issue is solving the wrong problem, right? Mm-hmm. We're often convinced that I just need to tell people there's evidence in the world that lots of people believe that just telling people louder and more emphatically that something's that they need to change a behavior is going to have an effect. And I'm pretty sure if that was true, nobody would like eat junk food or smoke or, you know, fail to exercise or anything like that. So I'd like to kind of help people with a series of tools for thinking about, you're referencing a lot of stuff that I had in chapter seven, which is the sort of whole checklist of things that could be wrong in a scenario and and whether or not this is something training can have a role to play. In. Yeah. And the answer, that was a fun chapter to write because there were a couple where I'm like, nope, it's not a training problem. You know, like misaligned incentives are a huge one. You were talking about incentive schemes. I, I was dealing with, a, it was a multinational insurance company and they were talking about the people who data enter the insurance policies. And it was a training program on how to do this. And they were like, can we put something in there about the importance of accuracy, because sometimes it doesn't seem like they care if they're putting the right, you know, if they're entering the information accurately. And I was like, yeah, sure, we can do that. Tell me again how they're in, how they're compensated for this. And they're like, oh, the number of applications they do per hour. Okay, yeah. great. Do, do they get any feedback on their accuracy levels? And they're like, no, I don't think they do. And I'm like, okay. So 
maybe you see the issue, you know, like did they we see can it? say, did that client see I, the issue? I think, I think they got there, All right. I, you know, Sometimes whether they, did they anything, don't see it, even when you, whether they did anything about it or not, I'm not sure. But like, if you're in a system where I'm paying you per hour, you know, number of applications per hour, and there's no feedback mechanism around accuracy. Hey, guess what? We can put all of the little notes about accuracy in the training that you want, and it's not going to change things. Yeah. So, um, yeah, incentives are so important. Yeah. And you they've know. got secondary repercussions and tertiary repercussions. Mm-hmm. And there's just like, it's hard to get the incentives right, especially across an organization of people with all sorts of different levels and competing priorities. And, but it is worth thinking about what the incentives are. Yeah. Well, and you mentioned learned helplessness and that's a big one for me because I'll go into these organizations and I'm there. Like they brought me in to talk about, here's all the ways you can make your training more interesting and engaging and effective and all this kind of stuff. And I'm doing this and they're like, IT won't let us do that. We tried that before and managers wouldn't support it. We couldn't get the employees to take the training. Da, 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 right? Like, and that's all this form of learned helplessness where people have tried to do the right thing and gotten discouraged or disincented to do the right thing in the past. And here's the thing about that. Like, they're not wrong. They're not wrong about their experience. Their experience was, I tried to do that and I got shut down in all of these ways. And now I'm not going to even try anymore. So, you know, you bring me in to try to help them think about ways to improve it. And all of a sudden they're kind of like, no, here are all the reasons why they won't let us do that. And it's like, that's really unfortunate, but they're also speaking to you from their actual experience And the only way that you can really address learned helplessness is to have the experience of it, have the opposite experience, the experience of it going well, the experience of it actually working. You probably need it more than once to kind of undo the, you know, the old damage. So when you go into, because I can always tell, like I go into certain organizations and people are like, oh yeah, we could do this. We could do this. We could do this. And it's great. That's super fun for me. Right. But then I go into other organizations and they're like, nope, 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 nope. Yeah, and here's all the ways we, you know, yeah. yeah. And it's kind of like, I'm sorry, guys. I, you know, I can't, I can't fix this as an external person and you have my ardent sympathy and I can try to explain a little bit of the issue to, you know, the management people who brought me in, but, you know, we can't fix this with good ideas. We have to fix this at the barriers level and give you the experience of, it working before you're going to believe it can be done again. Yeah. Well, Julie, we are over time here. I know that we had (laughs) talked about and uh, as expected, have not gotten to all the questions that I had. So you clearly are an expert in this. You're clearly passionate about it. We could talk about it for a long time, but just a couple questions to wrap up. Where can people find you, engage with you if they want to learn more about this or, or even engage you to help them? Yeah, absolutely. So my website is usablelearning.com and I do consulting and workshops. I've been adding in behavioral and curriculum audits. So kind of an audit package to help people, you know, you can take a particular behavior change challenge or set of challenges and kind of work through the process with it. Or, you know, from a curriculum audit point of view, I have an online course on how to make your learning more engaging available at designbetterlearning.com. I'm out on LinkedIn probably more than I should be sometimes. And uh, and I have a Facebook group for Design for How People Learn that is full of lots of interesting and experienced instructional designers. So if anybody has questions about that, they can use that as a resource as well. So I love it. I love it. One One last question, which is what one or two suggestions would you have that people can take back and start to actually implement in their day-to-day related to instructional design? Yeah, I do think looking at the feedback mechanism for any of the behaviors that that you're dealing with, because like I said, the most common issue whenever we've got any of these kinds of difficult to implement behaviors is that there's kind of an absence of an absence of feedback or a delay to the feedback that they're that they're dealing with. And that's I I would say I've never seen a behavior change challenge that didn't have that elephant element. Elephant. See, there we go. There you um, go. That was a good slip right at the end. I like it, actually. Maybe I'm going to have to use that. That didn't have that particular elephant issue. And thinking about kind of that immediacy of use, how do you make things concrete and tangible for people? How do you give people ways to use the things that they're learning right away? All of those kinds of things are are fairly, have a good solid evidence base behind them as being things that will will improve all of it. Because a lot of times 
we deal with abstractions because we're big organizations or big companies and things like that. And some of this is abstract. But if there's any way we can make it concrete for talking, you know, because the elephant loves things that are concrete and tangible and immediate. So if there's any ways to figure out how to do that for people, that will probably help. Well, good luck to everybody who is listening. There's a ton in here that I think people can take and put into practice, including your tips there at the end. And then obviously a lot of ways to engage with you, Julie, for folks who want to. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you folks for listening. And this has been a a ton of fun and I think will be really practical. So thank you. Thank you for having me. Hey folks, one last thing before you go. If you enjoyed the episode, make sure to hit subscribe so you can stay up to date with future guests. That's it. Thanks for coming. Go make the most of your business and the people in it.